Hey everyone, I'm Adam Dede and welcome to Neuro Journal Club. Today we're going to be moving away from talking about conscious states and now talking about conscious content. So the question we're going to be asking is, where is conscious content represented? So first let's talk about what does it mean to talk about a state versus talking about content. So the state is the overall mode. This is kind of what is the overall mode of being that the brain happens to be in. And really obvious states are states like sleeping, coma, wakefulness, drowsiness, excitement, mania. Um, state kind of overlaps a little bit with emotion or mood. Things that are overall order parameters that set the tone for the way in which information will be processed but are not themselves information. The information is the content. So content is the information currently being considered. And you could imagine that the state will in some ways determine what content makes it into consciousness. For example, if you happen to be really sad, you're in a sad state, you're going to be more likely to remember times when you felt sad or times when things went poorly. We have a negative bias when we happen to be sad. And that's a state. Or when you're asleep, you're not necessarily going to feel it if a mosquito bites you. Whereas when you're awake and alert, you will feel it when the mosquito bites you. So that's a difference in the way that your state changes what information makes it into consciousness, what content makes it into consciousness. So where is the content? That's really the question that we're asking today. Where does that content get stored or represented or processed in the brain? So does the whole brain do consciousness? Is, is information that is the content of consciousness represented across the whole brain at once? Where's the line if it's not the whole brain? Which bits are the conscious bits and which bits are the not conscious bits? So the method key idea for the study that we're going to be looking at today is to compare minimally different situations. The idea is to make the only difference be that sometimes a, a perceptual object or a stimulus is conscious and sometimes it's not conscious. And then comparing the difference between when it's conscious versus when it's not conscious, we can hopefully start to gain some kind of an appreciation for what's the difference between content that makes it into consciousness versus content that does not make it into consciousness and where is that content that makes it into consciousness represented. So the study that we're going to be looking at today um, is from Logothetis and colleagues. This one's from Leopold and Logothetis, 1996. And we're going to be looking at a technique called binocular rivalry. And we're going to be looking at this in monkeys. So in the cartoon image here, you can see basically what the task is. So the monkey looks through a special device so that to his right eye, he's being presented with this stimulus, which is a, a grating where the diagonal lines go up and to the left. And then with his left eye, he's looking at a similar grating where the diagonals go up and to the right. And it turns out, this phenomenon of binocular rivalry, that when the two eyes are presented with competing images, the, con the conscious percept, the thing that, it, that the participant is actually aware of, will alternate between the image shown to the right eye and the image shown to the left eye. So what we can assume then is that at some points in time, the monkey is going to see that grating that goes up and to the right, and then at other times, the monkey is going to see that grating that goes up and to the left. And the monkey's perceptual experience will alternate between those two things. So the monkeys in this experiment were trained with two levers. And initially, they're being presented all the time, 100%, um, in both eyes, with just a grading going in this direction or just a grading going in this direction. And the monkeys are trained that whenever the, the grading is going in this direction, they use the right-hand lever, and that's going to be the lever that they use to indicate that they're seeing a grading going this way. And then they switch, and they use the left-hand lever whenever they see a grading going this way. And in that way, Leopold and Logothetis are able to train the monkey to report his conscious perception. And once the monkey gets to a point of being able to do this task with 95% accuracy, only then do they introduce these rivalrous trials where there are two different percepts, or two different stimuli, I should say, being presented to the two different eyes. And at that point, we now know that the monkey is well-trained to report with 
the two levers, which of the two stimuli he's seeing. And we know from human experiments that the conscious percept alternates between the images shown to the two eyes. So now we have a way for the monkey to report to us the changes in his conscious perception, even though there's no change with the stimuli being presented to the eyes. Now, what they're going to do in addition to this experiment with the monkey behaviorally reporting to us, they're also going to measure activity from inside the brain. And specifically, they're going to be measured. This is a monkey brain that we're looking at here, the front over on this side, the back over on this side. And we're going to be looking at activity coming from V1, V2. Um, they're going to kind of group these two areas together to a certain extent. We're going to look at activity coming from V4, so a higher area of visual processing, where V1 and V2 are kind of the primary areas of visual processing, where information first enters from the retina. And then we're also going to be looking at area IT, the inferior temporal cortex. And this is often an area where there are representations of kind of higher order objects like faces and fully built shapes. And in order to get this activation, what they're going to do is open a, open a hole in the skull and then drop electrodes directly into the brain so that they can look at the activity of single neurons. Okay, so here's what some of their data looked like. We're going to take a look now at some activity recordings of individual cell spiking from V4, so that higher area of visual perception. And what we're looking at here on the um, green slash pink line, we're looking at an indication of the monkey's response for what he's currently perceiving. And then on the upper trace, the vertical hash marks are indications of a neuron firing in area V4. And now I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play this through and what you're gonna see is that this little dot is gonna move along the line. It's gonna take about 11 seconds because this is an 11 second long trial. And as it goes, you're going to hear the sound of the neuron firing. And then I'm also going to present to you down in this space and this space the percept that the monkey is currently reporting having conscious awareness of. And what I want you to try and do is think about, is there some kind of a pattern to the way in which this neuron fires? Does this neuron tend to fire with one of the percepts or the other? So take a look. So what's kind of cool here is it seems like every time that grading going up and to the left is presented, we see an increase in the number of spikes. And that grading going up and to the left is represented by the pink uh, response. And you can see that here. We see this increase in firing as the up and to the left stimulus is perceived by the monkey. Here we see it again. And here we see it again. Now at the beginning there is a general burst of firing, but you could argue that that's simply generalized excitement in the system with something changing in the perceptual environment. But keep in mind that after that initial change, that initial change uh, here being represented by this black line, there are no more changes in the external environment. The only change is the monkey's perception. So now let's take a look at what happened in area V1, V2, in addition to V4, which we're looking at right now, and then also in area IT, and further, let's take a look at it over the whole population of cells that were recorded. So they bend their cells into either being modulated or non-modulated. So the example cell that we just looked at would be an example of a modulated cell, a cell that changes as a function of the monkey's conscious perception. And what we can see here is that when Logothetis and Leopold took a look back in V1, V2, about 80% of cells were non-modulated. They would fire in exactly the same way, regardless of the monkey's conscious report. But in V4, the story changed. In V4, only 60% were non-modulated, and now it was up to 40% of the cells were modulated by the monkey's conscious perception. Still though, the majority of them are just firing to faithfully represent whatever's hitting the retina and are not paying attention to what the monkey's consciously perceiving. But then, once they moved all the way up to IT, they found a very different story. Here, about 90% of the cells were modulated by the monkey's conscious perception, 
where only 10% were non-modulated. So it seems like there's some kind of a hierarchy of modulation where the further you get in the processing stream, the higher the percentage of cells that are being modulated by consciousness as opposed to being modulated by the incoming stimulus that is actually hitting the retina. So what can we conclude from this? So it seems like as you move from primary to secondary to association cortices, you also move from you also move more and more conscious. Signals in V1 tend to faithfully represent the outside world, whereas signals in IT tend to represent perception. But there are some remaining questions for us to think about. So what decides what info from V1 makes it into IT? Is V1 really not conscious? Are we really unaware of the things that are in V1? And how do we transition information that's in V1 that's necessary to reach our conscious perception? I mean, if the monkey doesn't get that information about the oriented grading from V1, he's never going to become conscious of it. So the information is making it into consciousness from V1, but is it really not conscious at the stage of being in V1? And how do different states alter this content flow? So as information moves from V1, to IT goes from being relatively not conscious to being conscious, how does, how does the state, the overall kind of order parameter of the system, how does that change that flow? So anyway, that's the video for today. Again, I'm Adam Dede. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe, and you can click the link below to support me on Patreon.